afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, one of the co-directors of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. Um, and this afternoon it is our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ford Bell, president of the American Alliance of Museums. At the apex of a distinguished interdisciplinary career, which includes his background as a veterinarian and a nonprofit executive, Dr. Bell has led the AAM from 2007 to the present. In May, Dr. Bell will retire from his post, having revitalized the AAM in many important ways. Under his aegis, the organization has further strengthened its commitment to unifying museums, addressing the needs of its membership, and further making the case for the critical importance of museums to their communities through their educational programs, cultural initi initiatives, and their critical contribution to the American economy. Indeed, it's recognition for the need for coordinated support and a coordinated understanding of these many different facets of what museums contribute to their community helped inspire Dr. Bell and his colleagues to lead a major rebranding of the AAM in 2012. This led to the transformation of a century-old identity as the American Association of Museums to that which has now become the American Alliance of Museums. The success of that shift can be seen in the tremendous spike it generated in membership, leading to the highest number of museum members in the history of the organization. Today, the AAM, which serves all museum professionals, is without doubt the most important central resource museums have as a whole for addressing concerns and questions related to how to fulfill our missions and to serve our publics most effectively. Perhaps most importantly, AAM is leading the way in developing channels and creating initiatives to enable museums to come together to support one another. As personal experience confirms, this is a commitment that has emphatically been nurtured directly by Dr. Bell. Indeed, I, on a, a personal note, I have to reveal that when Frank and I were approached with the opportunity to co-head the Bowdoin Museum, it was to Ford who we first turned. Among the milestone achievements of his tenure at the AAM are the creation of, the, of, museums, of museums Advocacy Day, in which leaders from nearly all 50 states gather in the, in the national capital to make the case for the significance of museums. Also, the reinvention of museum reaccreditation to make the process more effective and efficient, though no less thorough. And the launch of the Center for the Future of Museums, an area of AAM that is doing groundbreaking research and identifying social trends that will impact museums. The Bowdoin College Museum of Art has been the direct beneficiary on many occasions of AAM support, and we are delighted to have earned reaccreditation last fall. Our colleagues at the Peary McMillan Arctic Museum here on campus are similarly accredited, enabling us here at Bowdoin to have some insight into the very broad range of museums supported by AAM. Something of the range of Dr. Bell's own commitment to the diverse spectrum of museums that nurture our country is reflected in his previous service as chair of the board of the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and as a longtime board member of the Bell Museum of Natural History at the University of Minnesota. In an era of increasing pathways to, of access to information, 
of increasing diversity in our communities, of heightened attention to the power of our cultural his heritage, our appreciation of the important role to be played by museums as civic institutions continues to magnify. We are delighted to have Dr. Bell here with us today to share his vision for the 21st Century Museum. Please, welcome me, please join me in welcoming Ford Bell. Thank, thank you, Anne. Um, I, uh, I, I'm very grateful for the invitation that you extended to me. I'm grateful to you and Frank for hosting me here today. And I'm thrilled to make my first visit to uh, Bowdoin College campus uh, it's, it's, and to Brunswick. It's great to be here. Um, I, I, I didn't get the job that I'm in right now because I'm a veterinarian, in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> There may be some truth to the fact that we represent a wide range of institutions and maybe representing all those type, different types of institutions would be a little bit like herding cats, but I actually didn't learn how to do that in veterinary school. So um, I, I, I am, I'm very pleased to, over the past eight years to have had a job um, with the oldest and largest museum organization in the world, the American Alliance of Museums, founded in 1906 as the American Association of Museums, founded by our country's leading museum institutions, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Field Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, and many others. Today, AAM is the organization that accredits U.S. museums, as you heard, and just over a thousand museums have achieved that distinction, representing about 5% of museum institutions in the United States. So the Bowdoin College Museum of Art is one of those museums putting it in a very, very elite class of great museums, such as the Met, the Getty, the National Gallery, MoMA, and many, many others. The standards that AAM accreditation represents are considered the highest museum standards in the world. And we are working with many countries, from Saudi Arabia to Mexico to China, to help them adapt these standards for use in their museums. They came to us and, and many, many other countries wanting access to our standards and best practices. We are happy to share with our colleagues around the world. We also lobby for museums, publish books about museum practice, offer continuing education for museum professionals, collaborate with the State Department on a very successful international exchange program called Museums Connect. We should talk about that. Um, and, and we put on the AAM annual meeting, an educational gathering that brings together five to 7,000 museum professionals from more than 50 countries every year. This year's conference will be in Atlanta, April 26 through 29. And I have to put in a plug, Anne mentioned, our Center for the Future of Museums, led by Elizabeth Merritt. Her annual Trends Watch report is extremely popular in the field. And Trends Watch 2015 is now available at our website, on our website, at no charge. And she puts out the weekly dispatches from the future of museums that now has some 35,000 subscribers and is far more popular than our 109-year-old magazine. <laughs> dispatches offers a weekly digest, weekly, of curated clippings for museum futurists and museum professionals, highlighting trends that are likely to remake our culture and society in the decades ahead, along with tools and technologies that can help museums embrace the future and examples of museum innovation in action. For clarity's sake, I, I'm, I know I'm stating the obvious, but just, just to be sure, when I use the word museum, it's a very generic use of the word. I'm referring to that diverse group of institutions ranging from A to Z, art museums to zoos, that we represent, a group that includes, as well, children's museums, our national parks, public gardens, aquariums, and science centers, to name only a few. Over the past eight years, I've had an intense education about museums and about the museum field. And 501 museums and 600,000 miles and 46 states later, I have some thoughts about museums in the 21st century. It's very clear that museums occupy a very special place in American society. And a couple of statistics underscore that assertion. First is the incredible attendance at museums in our country. Some 850 million attendees every single year. Now, not that I'm counting, <laughs> but that is six times, actually it's more than six times, 6.5 times 
Not that I'm counting. Uh, the attendance at all major league sporting events, baseball, basketball, football, and hockey, regular season games. So museums win 6.5 to 1. <laughs> the other telling statistic, and it's a statistic that some of you are undoubtedly included in, is that Americans donate 1 million hours of their time to museums in our country every single week. That's an astounding statistic, and when I first heard it, I thought it was literally unbelievable. But after those eight years in the job, I think it's probably too low. I recently spoke at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, and that museum benefits from volunteer commitments that exceed 65,000 hours every year. One institution, that's the equivalent of 31 full-time positions. Museums thrive in large part because of the incredible commitment of their volunteers. Museums have been around since the first museum, the Charleston Museum, opened in South Carolina in 1773. And since that first museum opened, museums have been committed to education. We know that museums spend something in excess of $2 billion every year on educational programming in the United States. And of course, that figure doesn't account for that staggering number of volunteer hours that support museums' educational mission. And at this juncture, I have to compare that figure, $2 billion, with another figure, $30 million. $30 million is the size of the largest pool of money for museums in the federal budget. That's $30 million with an M. That amount is granted through the Institute of Museum and Library Services, a federal agency with a director appointed by the president. It's a very small federal agency with some 60 staff members, and it's a great agency. But they don't have much money to give away to museums. And at AAM, we spend a lot of time and effort lobbying to maintain that funding. And this year, we are hoping that the president's proposal to increase that number by $5 million will make it through the budget process. I'd say we get a pretty good return on that investment of $30 million when you look at the $2 billion museums spend on education. It's actually a return of over 6,000%. Museums are one thing above all. They are institutions that make every dollar go a long way. Field trips have been a staple of museum education for more than a century, but the modern field trip is a far cry from the field trips that I enjoyed more than 50 years ago, which were largely a romp through empty halls and having a good time. Today, every field trip in the United States is specifically tied to one or more state educational standards. So the tri field trip is really an extension of the classroom. But the traditional field trip is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to education, museums' a central role, central role, education. Museums throughout the United States offer a portfolio of educational programming, including field trips, after-school programs, virtual programs, outreach programs, and teacher training. Museums produce textbooks and other materials for children to use in their classroom. And museums are also essential resources for the two million homeschool children in the United States today. You, all you have to do is ask them. So here's what 21st century museums are in fact today. They are educational institutions, as I have pointed out. But museums have even expanded the traditional museum role. And museums now host preschools and elementary schools, and they host high schools and even graduate schools in the case of the American Museum of Natural History. And I believe that art museums have a unique role to play in that educational mission. And I will get back to that later, not much later. I'm going to talk for 15 minutes. And then we're going to have a Q&A sitting here, just so you don't think I'm going to drone on for an hour and you're bracing yourself for that. I'm not going to talk that long. <laughs> Museums are, first and foremost, community institutions. If you name a community problem, I will find you a museum that is working to solve that problem with creative, imaginative, cost-effective means. Whether it's hunger, children with developmental challenges, children caught up in the juvenile justice system, adults with cognitive disorders, hunger, homelessness, water quality, integration of new Americans, childhood obesity, neighborhood revitalization, community design, grade level reading, and on and on. I will find you a museum that is working to address one of those problems in a creative, cost-effective manner. 
Museums are at their core community institutions and they position themselves to help address community problems. Museums are research institutions doing every type of research imaginable from archaeology to medicine and from astrophysics to art history. <clears throat> Museums are economic engines. Cultural tourists stay 53% longer and spend 35% more money than other kinds of tourists. And travelers are drawn to cities with great museums. I'll give you one example. I know it's an outrageous example, but I'll still give you one example. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York commissioned an economic impact study following three ma major exhibitions that it did in the spring of 2012. The economic impact of those three major exhibitions on the city of New York was $750 million. Yes, I know it's, it's New York and it's the Met, but it still underscores the undeniable fact that museums provide economic benefit to their communities. And then I want to quote Congressman Paul Tonko, who represents New York's 20th congressional district. Congressman Tonko has been a dedicated supporter of arts and culture, including museums, and, and he shows up at every event we have. He's very, very loyal. He likes to say that museums create, and I quote, place esteem. And he is absolutely right. Museums are at the heart of great cities, large and small. Imagine Chicago without the Field Museum, or San Diego without its zoo, or Birmingham without its Civil Rights Institute, or New Orleans without the World War II Museum. But we are here we are across the street. I was just in a great art museum. And I believe that art museums have a very unique role to play in our society today. The challenge is, and here I'm expressing what I lovingly refer to as the Bell Hypothesis. <laughs> the challenge that is that in our society, I believe we silo creativity. I have heard very, very smart people make comments like, it's fine for the students to spend time running around the art museum, or it's fine for the students to spend some time splashing paint on an easel, and other disparaging comments about art education and about opportunities for young people to experience art. But the reality is the brain doesn't silo creativity. The creative mind is one that has been nurtured on diverse experiences, including the opportunity to perceive and reproduce to create something unique, to interpret life's experiences and memories through the creative process. Einstein understood that, and that's why he said, quote, the best scientists are artists. And of course, he himself was an artist, an accomplished violinist all of his life. According to an article in the journal Pilos Biology from February 2013, and I quote, Einstein believed his insight like that of an artist, came more from intuition than from intellectual reasoning. Other successful scientists count intuition, defined as instinctive knowing without the use of rational processes, as an important component of scientific discovery. Perhaps one of the reasons Nobel Prize winning scientists are almost three times more likely to have an arts and crafts avocation is because intuition is so central to the artistic process, end quote. I believe that the educational opportunities that art museums offer to primary and secondary students in our society will help us develop the creative minds that we need to remain competitive as a nation in the 21st century, just as museums are also able to offer important programs that benefit those who suffer from a wide range of cognitive disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. So what is the essential museum of the 21st century? It is the museum I was just at, the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. An expiring, an, a really inspiring example of the diverse and critical and unique roles that museums play in our society today. Museums strengthen communities, they empower citizens, and they allow our young people to dream. But the essential 21st century museum will be a museum that is appreciated for what it is, a community institution that educates and enriches. Part of a field, A to Z, art museums to zoos, that enlightens and excites that, and that strengthens communities across our country. 
But today, from the standpoint of policy making and resource allocation at the federal, state, and local levels, museums are viewed as amenities. The $30 million figure that represents the Institute of Museum and Library Services annual allocation to museums, the largest amount in the federal budget by far, as I said, and the paltry $5 million increase we are asking for in fiscal year 2016 only underscore that perception of our field as nice to have, but not necessary. Wayne Clough, the past secretary of the Smithsonian, said to me once in frustration, and I quote, people think we hang stuff on walls here, end quote meaning that no one understood the research and education impact that are essential components of the Smithsonian's great art collections. Or, as he pointed out, no one ever says to me, Wayne, it's so great that the Smithsonian is one of the three largest astrophysical research organizations in the world, end quote. People are always burying the lead when it comes to museums. The essential 21st century museum will be one that is appreciated for what it is and does as a community institution supported appropriately by individual donors, by corporations and foundations, as well as by federal, state, and local governments. Today, state and local support for arts and culture, including museums, ranges from scant to non-existent, despite the fact that museums bring people to their communities. The World War II Museum in New Orleans, an experience I highly recommend, is currently in the process of developing its own hotel to better accommodate the visitors who come to that museum from every part of our country. The essential 21st century museum will be seen as just that, essential. Essential to the success of communities, essential to our educational and economic infrastructures, essential to a healthy planet. We need everybody who works for, volunteers for, or enjoys museums to speak up for museums in order to create that successful, essential 21st century museum. I like to say, only half joking, that every museum should have a kiosk in the lobby. And it's a kiosk where you could go and you could write one letter. We do this on our website to some extent. You can go and you can write a letter to your member of Congress or your state legislator. You can use our letter or you can modify our letter or you can write your own letter. But the kiosk in the lobby of the museum should just allow every visitor, if they wish, to write one letter to their city council member, their county commissioner, their state legislator, their federal legislator. And they only have to say two things. Why that museum is important to them personally and why that museum is important to their community. And if even a tiny fraction of those 850 million museum visits in the United States every year resulted in a letter, then elected officials would have a different, different opinion about the role of museums in our society today. So thank you for your support of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art and your support of museums. And thank you for inviting me to be with you this afternoon. And we're gonna answer questions and have a discussion, and I hope, hope you'll ask your questions if, if you have them. Thank you. Ford, thank you for um, a truly inspiring set of remarks. Um, I think it's deeply moving and exciting to all of us to think about the important civic role museums have to play. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it is the case that when Frank and I first thought about stepping up from curatorial posts into the role of directors of a um, university or of a of a campus museum, it it was first to Ford. Bell, who we turned. And so I can definitely say that everything he said is something that he lives. Um, more and more, we see museums in the pages um, of 
the newspaper, and Frank and I and Ford thought it might be fun to take advantage of this opportunity to uh, speak as a group about what museums mean, mean today. Um, Frank and I each have, have a few questions, but we imagine um, that people here in the audience will have questions as well. So we're very eager to open up the floor um, to questions in a moment. And we have two um, wonderful um, students who are going to assist with um, microphones. We are actually recording today's event, so we hope that you will take advantage of the microphone for that purpose. Um, Frank? Why don't we ask the first couple questions and then we'll open up the floor to you. Uh, as you all uh, know well, central uh, to the mission of Bowdoin College is the importance of the common good, the service uh, that its graduates, uh, that its faculty, its staff have uh, to enhancing um, the community uh, here uh, and and further afield, and uh, I wonder if if you might sort of talk about um, the work that museums do in sort of fostering the common good when there is this larger perception uh, that uh, many museums are simply. Um, uh, sort of jewel boxes, uh, temples uh, for precious objects, and whether you might provide uh, maybe a specific example or two of museums that have helped sort of change the uh, perception about uh, the role that they play in fostering dialogue and change and service in a community. Okay. You know, I'm going to get this right. Um, uh, museums, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, museums play that unique role. And one of my favorite stories, um, I'm probably the only person in the room that's been to San Angelo, Texas. Um, San Angelo is the largest, is the only city of 100,000 people or more that is more than 100 miles from an interstate. So San Angelo is in West Texas, and um, anybody from San Angelo, I'm not going to say anything bad about San Angelo, but <laughs> if, uh, if you're getting nervous, I'm not going to say anything bad. So San Angelo is, is n there's nowhere near the interstate. Um, it's, it's a very isolated city. It's, it's, it's uh, about 100,000 people, and a lot of uh, cattle are raised there. And they have an art museum, the San Angelo Museum of Art, which is, um, I think, an, uh, really an iconic museum for what museums can do. Um, the, the director decided water quality, water issues are huge in San Angelo, obviously, because of drought and, and potable water and so forth. So he decided that water quality was an important issue. So he bought a building that near the, across the street from the art museum and created a, um, a water quality camp for fourth graders uh, with the public school. And the federal government, uh, Department of Interior, uh, came in and, and, and partnered with him. And this is an ongoing program where you go and you see what these kids are doing in this laboratory. They're doing their own experiments. They're uh, testing the water. They're uh, looking at how animals are surviving. They're caring for animals that they find in the river and studying the animals that live in the, in the, in the San Angelo River there that flows through the town. Um, so th then um, he decided that this, the community needed um, some upgrading. So he created a design competition um, that happens every couple years where people in the community submit proposals for designs, whether it's design of the new bridge across the river, design for, uh, of public art, uh, whatever. Um, he uh, has, uh, he supports, he has made that possible. Uh, he is involved in a wide range of activities supporting the Latino community there in San Angelo. They have, um, the, the Latino community or any community can, in, the, in the city can come and use the museum for their gatherings free of charge. Uh, he has educational programs for um, art programs in both English and Spanish. They do wellness programs in the museum, in the art museum. Uh, when they were building a new central library, he not only helped raise money for their new central library, but he sublet 4,000 square feet in the new central library that he said, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to use it for, but I'll find something to use it for, for programming downtown, which of course supported the library. Um, when I was there, people took me aside and they said, the San Angelo Museum of Art has transformed this community in every way. And it has brought people together. It has been a forum for conversations about community issues. It has improved 
the quality of life for the citizens. It has improved education at every level, created great programs, uh, art programs for senior citizens, as I mentioned, for children, for immigrants, and so forth. It, it, it's an example of how a museum that says, I can do something about this, and they, they will have an impact. And museums are able to do th things like this because they have resources that lend themselves well to that. They have classrooms. They have computers. They have libraries. They have educators. And, and so they, and they know their communities, and they know what the needs are. And I, I think there's lots of stories like that uh, of museums in small communities and large communities that have created incredible transformative programs. For, it's so uh, exciting to hear about what a museum can mean um, to a small community. Um, another um, city that we know um, has very much been in the news recently um, around this very subject of what the museum means to um, the, the city and the community has been the Detroit Institute of Arts. And that, of course, as we know, is a very complex question which comes down to the question of how um, museums serve their communities, um, the different constituencies who may be involved in um, determining um, their futures. Um, I wonder if you might be able to speak a little bit about um, what has been transpiring in Detroit, um, the challenge um, that Graham Beale as director has faced in terms of preserving that collection, which of course was under threat of being um, uh, deaccessioned and, and sold um, due to economic distress. Yeah, that was a, I'm sure that a lot of you have been reading about the soap opera that is uh, the, the situation with the Detroit Institute of Arts where uh, it's a unique situation because the, the museum does not own most of the collection, the city owned most of the collection. So that created a, a problem when, when the city was went into bankruptcy. And uh, obviously many people looked to the um, collection as, as a, a fungible asset that could be used to support the city. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just back up a, a couple of years. Um, the Detroit Institute of Arts was struggling financially. Um, obviously the city has shrunk dramatically. Um, many companies that supported the auto industry have gone bankrupt. And um, a lot of the, the, the large auto companies are not as large as they once were, not employing as many people. So it created a very difficult situation. So the Detroit Institute of Arts asked for a millage rate in the three counties um, surrounding Detroit. Um, and um, that is, they asked for a, a, you know, a, a, an override on the tax, a property tax that would go to the museum for a period of 10 years. Um, and uh, the, the museum, this is a, it's kind of an, in case you hadn't noticed, kind of an anti-tax environment and, um, and certainly was in Detroit. And the museum worked very hard to connect to the communities, but they obviously couldn't connect to everybody in those three counties. But when the, when the vote was held, the, the citizens of the three counties around Detroit voted to tax themselves. And you know that there's a lot of people that voted for that that had never set foot in the museum. But they knew the museum was important. And they, were, they voted to ensure that the museum would be sustainable and would be there in the future. Then two years later, the city says, actually, that artwork you voted to save, we're going to sell <laughs> and, and, and use it to bail us out. And I think you saw the outcry that came, uh, that resulted in that, uh, following that announcement of the city wanting to sell the art. There was an outcry across, of course, across the museum field, but there was an outcry in the city as well, uh, outrage that, um, that, that they would sell this artwork that was so valuable that they had voted to tax themselves to support it. So thanks to that, that outcry uh, from, from everywhere and, um, and, and people understanding that, you know, this is, as far as ethics go, selling the, selling the artwork to pay bills is the ultimate, ultimate sin in, in the museum field. But it was the feeling of the people in the community, I think, that really made a difference and the willingness of people of means to step up uh, and make contributions, and the Detroit Institute of Arts itself and its great director, Graham Beale, committed to raise $100 million themselves to go into the Workers' Pension Fund. So, so it, it could have been a disaster and a decimation of one of, one of the great collections uh, in American art museums uh, today. It's, it's a fascinating issue. We'd love to open up the floor um, to all of you to have an opportunity to chime in. Frank and I 
have plenty of other things we'd love to discuss too, but we know what an extraordinary resource we have in each of you, and we'd, we'd love to get your thoughts. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, well, obviously of interest to all of us here at Bowdoin is the role of the campus museum. And so I think I would love to hear all three of your thoughts on the role of the campus museum, both in the campus community itself and then beyond to outreach to other constituencies. Um, I think that we understand that the campus museum is in a real, relatively unique position in which it can take advantage of a multitude of constituencies from alums to students, but then also we have underwrite support potentially from the administration. Simultaneously, we can fall prey and this is not the case, of course, at Bowdoin, um, to administrations that may not be as friendly to the arts and may see museums as somewhat semi-liquid assets. So I guess I'd love to hear all of your thoughts, especially Anne and Frank, coming into campus setting relatively recently, and then also where you see campus museums going in the future, specifically. Yeah, I mean, campus museums uh, are, great, great resources for the institution. At my home institution, where I graduated, where I worked um, as a, on the, at the College of Veterinary Medicine, we, we have um, four uh, campus museums uh, ranging from um, a very large arboretum to um, a very small museum of, of design and uh, a natural history museum and an outstanding, outstanding art museum. Uh, and and uh, and I've watched over the years um, the, the the progress of those institutions and what they contribute uh, to the campus life. Now, if you're at a Big Ten school, which I don't, you're not a Big Ten school, are you? <laughs> uh, Maybe a small ten. <laughs> if, if if you're a, a, a Big Ten school, there's this other this other. 9,000 pound gorilla in the room, um, w w which is uh, the, the, the teams um, and stadiums. So, uh, so we, uh, that, that's always a challenge. And I have seen in my 25 years or so of being involved um, uh, with the museums at the University of Minnesota that it really depends a lot on the administration. And y you can get a president who says, I get it. I get it 100%. Uh, and what, what he gets is, is that um, museums, bring people on campus without any regard for one loss records. <laughs> you know, if the, if the football team is 0-12 and, and has been for three years, they ain't coming. But they'll come to the museum. And museums are one of the great portals to the community. They allow the community to access the, we want the community to support the museum and we want them to feel that they have some ownership. And, you know, sports teams can do that, but museums do it year-round on campus. They bring people to the, to, the, to the campus, to the school, they bring them back, and they allow them to be engaged, and they allow them to understand why the museum is so important. And of course, as I saw today, museums are great, great teaching institutions as well, and provide an opportunity to see uh, great works of art, or scientific specimens, or whatever, whatever the, um, uh, the, the museum is. But I think they're, they're very, very unique. And, um, and in, a, in a really good institution, a museum, a campus museum or museums are valued for what the many contributions they make. Those are absolutely wonderful comments. And one of the things um, that, and I'll look forward to hearing Frank's comments on this in a moment, one of the things um, that I think the two of us have valued so much about Bowdoin is that it, it, it has been our experience that not only is um, the uh, Bowdoin College Museum of Art physically in the center of the campus, but it is intellectually very much at the center of the campus. And that has very much to do with the efforts of, um, I think, virtually everyone in this room. We have exceptionally talented uh, students. We have exceptionally talented colleagues who really uh, do everything they can to promote interactions between um, students, um, uh, faculty, and museum professionals. Um, I have to acknowledge that the Mellon Foundation's support and helping to underwrite a 
postdoctoral position as well as programming along those lines. And I also want to acknowledge um, the strong support we have from the administration. Um, I know that um, one of the uh, signature achievements, at least in our view, of um, Barry Mills's administration, which has been very successful, was the renovation of the uh, Walker Art Building between 2005 and 2007 um, by uh, 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 Mikado and Silvetti. And actually, just earlier today, um, Ford and I were, were speaking with um, a couple of students and thinking about some of the architectural changes that Mikado and Silvetti introduced with that renovation, um, one of which, of course, is that the um, entrance entrances to the museum now both look out on Park Row as well as on the campus. But there was a really interesting point, and I have to credit uh, Julian Ehrlich and June Lay here, um, that they brought up, which I hadn't actually noticed before. And that is that unlike the McKim Mead and White facade, there are no steps. And that was kind of intriguing to me. It, it, it's transparent, and I think that there's a sense in which the architecture invites the community um, into that space. Um, one of the things that um, Frank and I are also very interested in promoting, and we think actually that a campus museum is a, quite an important place to model this, is to think about what we can do in terms of providing not just physical access, but also virtual access to our collections. And I think in the digital world, it almost no longer matters whether one is a Big Ten institution, um, and we might think about the big the Big Ten of, of museums as well, or whether one is um, of a smaller physical scale, what we can do intellectually is extraordinary. And what I love about Bowdoin is I feel that every day we answer what um, my husband likes to call the so what question. Why are we here? And the students are challenging us to ask that all the time. The faculty is challenging us to ask that all the time. And what's most satisfying is that we have an opportunity to think broadly about the many, many answers to that question. And I'll just finally um, acknowledge and let, let Frank say a few words how uh, appreciative we are um, to be um, uh, partners um, uh, on this campus with the Peary McMillan Arctic Museum. And we're very fortunate to have another um, exceptional colleague in Susan Kaplan, who's done a magnificent job of leading that museum. And it's a reminder that there are wonderful sorts of partnerships um, that can exist across campus, not just with uh, the world of academe, but also with thinking about different sorts of museum collections here at Bowdoin. I'll just add really um, shortly, um, you know, here in Maine, uh, museums have a longstanding uh, commitment uh, to serving uh, their communities. Um, and, you know, it's an extraordinary challenge uh, that a state like Maine has in making um, the arts, culture, science um, available to um, K through 12 audiences. Um, and. Uh, and and of course the general public uh, uh, just more generally and so I think that one of the exciting sort of conversations that's happening uh, not only in campus museums like our own but in uh, museums historical societies uh, science centers across the state is how do we work together collaboratively to provide to develop um, educational resources uh, that might be available uh, to communities, both uh, physically when they visit the museum, but also digitally as well. And I think it's really uh, exciting um, when people, um, institutions work uh, in partnership with one another uh, to see as a shared goal um, arts education, science education, uh, the uh, appreciation of the history of, of this place and the nation of, of the world itself. And it's something I think we look forward to doing more of um, is being this resource for Brunswick, uh, for the state of Maine and, and beyond. here in Maine, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are about the historic house museum world and historical societies, because Maine has a ton of wonderful little teeny historical societies and historic house museums that are all struggling to find their way in this new world. 
Okay, you're not going to report my answer back to Carl Nold, are you? All right, all right good. that's good. That's good. Um, now, um, you know, obviously, we, we represent historic museums and, 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 and historic houses. The, there's another association, this American Association of State and Local History, that we work very closely with. It also focuses on that. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of great historic houses that are struggling uh, to, to, to survive to, to, or, or to restore the house to, uh, to, in a manner that it will make it educational and make it appealing, make people want to come back. I think um, what, that's one of the great things. If we could get the, and I didn't mention this, but if we can get the Institute of Museum and Library Services funding up to that $100 million level that we're hoping to get, once we get, I think it's to $75 million, I can't remember, but then the state-based piece comes in where, where money goes to the states to be granted in the states. So um, that would allow the states to make small grants uh, that would really benefit um, uh, small history museums and historic houses that are struggling to preserve important local and regional heritages that, that we need to preserve. And if we could get that funding, then that would create a new source of, of, of income for, um, for, for small museums. In, in my home state of Minnesota, uh, we, the, the, the museum people worked, really the history people, worked with the, um, uh, the hunting and fishing crowd to uh, enact a state amendment that created an, uh, a tax um, override that would that would go to uh, uh, natural resources and arts and culture for a period of 15 years, I think it is. Well, that was great because our our museums got money they never had before. We're restoring our waters and lakes and habitats that are in danger. But the problem is, once that is that constitu once that constitutional amendment is over, and the work to get it to put it on the ballot cost a fortune. It cost a fortune and it took forever and it passed by a hair's breadth. And to have to do that again would, is, is such a huge waste of resources. What we want is we, we want legislation or we want access to federal funds as we would get through the uh, increase in the Institute of Museum and Library Services funding that provides stable sources of funding for museum for historic houses that, and historic properties that are valued. Now, not everyone is going to survive. It's just a reality. But there are a lot of them that should survive, and they, they're, they're, uh, lo many volunteers work long, long, hard hours to preserve those, and they have a, a role to play in communities. So we're hoping that um, working together as a field, speaking with one voice, this is like, as I said, it's like herding cats. We've got all these people out there, and we've got a lot of associations. But if we speak together and work as a field, we can increase that funding at IMLS, and I think that will help everybody. You've been very helpful talking about government support for the museums. Um, I'd love to get your overview of private philanthropic support for museums and how that's changed over the last 10 or 15 years from individuals and from corporations, from foundations. Uh, it seems to me there is some advantage of having little federal involvement in museums and that gives you all of us, a lot more flexibility and creativity. Uh, but I'm wondering what the patterns have been in private philanthropy. That's a, a really good question. Uh, you, um, uh, obviously, there are definitely upsides, and just stressing the federal piece for one second, there are upsides and downsides to that federal funding, no question, no question about it. But the good news is, maybe, is that we don't have to worry. We're not going to suddenly be awash in federal money. Um, and. Um, you know, even if we got to $100 million, it's still a tiny fraction of what museums spend in this country every year. Um, uh, we, it, it really varies a lot. Uh, we, museums depend on individuals, generosity of individuals. Um, it, it, corporations have really moved away. Now, it depends. In, in, my, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, we have Target. And, you know, uh, Target gives 5% of its pre-tax profits to charities every single year. And they have always made arts and culture a priority, which is great. But a lot of companies don't do that because they feel they need to support basic human needs. They need to address hunger, and they need to address schools, or they need to address um, uh, job training. And these are great, obviously, very important, too. Um, and so, um, and, and foundations vary. 
it, it varies a, a lot um, as to um, in the private foundations. Uh, Kresge Foundation used to be a very, very generous supporter of museums. They've really, they've moved away from that. They don't do their capital gifts anymore like they used to do. Um, and so I think we've not, maybe haven't lost it entirely, but we have lost it to some extent. Um, I think museums thrive because of the mix of fundraising that they do get money from foundations, they do get some money from local businesses, especially in small towns. Museums are very good at getting money. I've been at lots of events, lots of silent auctions where uh, local businesses have supported the museums. Um, some foundations, and, and uh, it would be great to see a little more f government money um, in, in the picture as well. It's not. It, 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 it's 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 stable to slightly less. It's not going up. The money going to museums is not increasing. Uh, museums are finding more and more ways to to raise money. You know, they're they're getting more and more creative about that. But they're having to work a lot harder to raise the money they were they were getting before. I hate to touch on a. A negative subject. Okay, then don't. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> the need for a museum to close, but I'm mm -hmm. uh, wondering if you could comment a bit. Um, some, uh, what comes to mind is the recent uh, Corcoran situation. It's a venerable museum. I remember having many, many uh, magnificent visits to that museum, and it's an incredible collection. And I'm just wondering, are there any lessons to be learned in terms of why an, a venerable institution like the Corcoran found it ne necessary to close its doors? Yeah, the Corcoran situation is a, is a very sad situation, very difficult situation. Um, <clears throat> now, depending on where you stand, um, it was either the, the end result was either good news or bad news. For, from my standpoint, uh, it could have been a lot worse. Um, the Corcoran building could have been a, a hotel and could have been the historic building, which is a short distance from our office and which is spectacular. It could have disappeared and been torn down, um, and we could have had some ghastly-looking um, Trump hotel there. You know, Mr. Trump is putting a hotel in the old post office there in, 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 on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, maybe he's going to preserve the building. I don't, I don't, I, I, you know, if, if you were, had your druthers in preserving a historic building, you probably wouldn't turn to Donald Trump. But anyway. Um, but I was really worried that the Corcoran building was going to be raised, that it was going to be sold. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, events overtook the Corcoran. Um, to start with, uh, they only had a $22 million endowment. Now, this is a museum that's been around since the 1870s, and it had, and that endowment barely keeps the lights on in a place, in a building like that. Um, so they were really hampered by not having a, an adequate endowment. And then they had... Um, and I wasn't there, and I can't comment uh, uh, on, uh, on the architecture, but when they when they're going to do the, uh, was it Frank Gehry edition? I think it was Frank Gehry that uh, the director was going to do the Frank Gehry edition and um, to, the, to, to, to the Corcoran back in the 90s, late 90s. Late 90s. Um, and um, that created a, absolutely David Levy was the director, that created a huge, Firestorm, and I have talked to board members in Washington who said, "You know, I will never give them another dime again because of what that man did." And it was very controversial, and I, I wasn't in there at the time, and I never saw the plans. But it created a huge division in the board, and a lot of the and, and there's Washington's not that big a town, and so and there's a lot of things to give to, and their donors basically walked away, um, and those donors didn't come back. So it it looked grim for a long time there, uh, and I, my personal belief is that the, end, the way it ended up was the best possible ending, which is that the National Gallery ha will have the collection, uh, and they'll maintain the building, so the building will be preserved and rehabilitated so that it's there to show art in, and you can go see art there, and uh, the school, which was the, which was the only thing that kept the Corcoran going, was the school. The school made money, the art school. That has gone to GW. And GW has just built a beautiful new museum and um, is, has a great museum studies program. And so I think that will be a good home for the school, I think. Events may prove me wrong on that. Um, and I think that the arrangement with the National Gallery is the best we could have hoped for because the alternative was the art be sold off 
dispersed around the country. Um, and they're, they're, if the, the National Gallery is going to dispose of art that doesn't fit in with their collections, but they're, going to disp they're not going to sell it. They're going to give it to museums in Washington, D.C. If there is art that they don't feel fits in with their collection, they will give it to museums in D.C., first choice, and then they will give it to museums around the country. So it will stay in the pu public domain. And um, it, it's, very, it's a very sad ending, but it could have been a lot worse, and, and, I, and I think we dodged a, a bullet. Um, I'm wondering what your impression is of the museum-going population in the United States, since you mentioned that museums have such high attendance and made several like comparisons to sporting events and how they do attract more, not business, but more attendance than sporting events in a lot of cases. I'm wondering what you make of the character of the museum-going population in its relative homogeneity, people being either out, you know, out of towners or of a certain age or affluent enough to attend the museum. Um, and what are some of the more creative ways you've seen museums uh, execute outreach programs or involve the local community in a way that, um, that kind of is not characteristic of big institutions like the Met where you feel like the population is either all field trips tourists or uh, people who have the free time to go or can afford to? Yes. <laughs> um, let me see if I can put all that into, uh, into an answer here. Um, I think there's a reason, I mean, I, I, if you look at museum population, the museum attendance population, it, it skews slightly older, obviously. Um, and all museums are concerned about how they're going to get young people that, that I can't remember the generations, I'm not going to call them that, but the, peop the 20s and the 30s, how they get them through the door. You know, all, museums are always uh, concerned about that and are looking at ways to attract those populations, putting on programs, uh, putting on social programs uh, that, you know, and I remember my daughter who was then 25 who has no interest in art, absolutely zero interest in art, and she said, I'm going to these, you know, these singles gatherings at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. I just about fell over. Um, but she loved going to those uh, as a social event. So my belief is if you get people through the door, you know, that, that's, that's, that's about half the battle because if you get them through the door, they say, oh, I didn't know this was here. Oh, my, I, I, I didn't know I could enjoy this. Um, and, of course, field trips are the, the, the farm, sort of the farm team for uh, museum attendance. And un unfortunately, there's a problem there because school budgets today are, don't accommodate field trips. I mean, a lot of museums are renting the buses and paying for the buses for kids to come to the museums. And, um, and, and that's really too bad because th when you get those kids going to that museum, I remember those visits myself, if, um, you know, it, it creates a lifelong, um, a lifelong bond with, with, with the museum. And that's really, really important. The, 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 I think the other issue you raised is an important one, which is that, um, uh, you know, the diverse populations that we have, and how do we reach out to those? And I always think about my home community and the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, uh, which is white, uh, both literally and in terms of its physical appearance, and, and, and figuratively as well. We have a, we have a population of over 100,000 Somalis in Minneapolis, and I don't think um, a Somali family walking by the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, even though it's free every day, um, would say, let's pop in. We have a great African collection, um, and um, I don't know if it would be relevant to them, but we have a great African collection. But I, I think that's a challenge that we face. We face it in Minneapolis um, with our increasingly diverse population. Um, we have the second largest Hmong population in the United States uh, after California. So how, how, do we, how do we reach out to these communities with programs that, that bring them in so they don't feel intimidated, they don't feel, I'll look out of place there? And I think that's a challenge that a lot of museums are addressing today, which is one reason why I think museums are doing reading programs or finding other kinds of in-school programs or adopting schools in their neighborhoods and, and doing things like that that, that bring, uh, find new ways to bring people in. I, I think that is going to, to be a, ch a challenge, and you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Sorry. Um, 
I guess uh, you spoke earlier about the AAM once meaning uh, American Association for Museums, and now it's changed to American Alliance. I was wondering if you could speak a bit to what the transition of meaning word there means. Um, and secondly, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding what the meaning of accreditation is. Um, I'm assuming if they're accredited institutions, they're un unaccredited institutions. And I'm wondering what those institutions look like and sort of what it means to have an alliance of accredited institutions. Okay, the first part of your question was, I'm sorry, why we changed our, uh, why we changed the name? Alliance. Okay, um, well, w that's, I'll just answer that one quickly. We, re AAM had a kind of a stale brand uh, it's, we, we were, you know, as a hundred and at that point, a hundred and five year old organization. Um, we looked like a hundred and five year old organization. Um, you know, we look like a museum, museum of an association, actually, is what we look like. Um, and we were doing things the same way forever. I mean, our, our website was, was designed in the 1950s. And so, you got to see it. I wish you, I'm glad you didn't actually. But anyway, so we, we went through a rebranding and we taught a lot about this issue um, of association, traditional trade association. It, does that really sound like a museum, a trade association? And we, we the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that we face in the field is speaking with one voice. And there are, so there are 42 state museum associations. There are six regional museum associations. There are a whole bunch of discipline-specific organizations, um, Council of American Jewish Museums, Living History Museums, Railroad Museums, Maritime Museums, Art Museums, Zoos, and Public Gardens. It's just a, we, it's an alphabet soup of organizations. And so what we wanted to do was to stop being the association of museums and become the cause of museums and, and bring everybody together. Accreditation, Accre accreditation is um, a voluntary standard, um, uh, Florida and, some states look at accreditation um, when they, if, they're do, if they have money for museum funding. Florida did, Pennsylvania is now. Some foundations, Kresge Foundation, looked at accredited status. But it's a voluntary program, excellence program. There are unaccredited museums, and there's lots of them, because there's only about 1,000 accredited museums. Now those 1,000 accredited museums represent um, probably 40% of museum attendance in our country. But, uh, and unaccredited museums are not bad museums. Uh, so, but a museum that goes through accreditation makes the decision that it wants to see how, how do we measure up to, the, to, the, to, to these standards um, and how, how can we, by going through this, can we, can we be a better museum? And the, the reason that accreditation is successful, even though uh, it used to require until, until recently, museums used to submit 35 pounds of paper, um, you know, it's online now. It's online, what a concept. Um, but it's because it, it's, it's based on, accreditation is based on self-study. So you, you go through the self-study yourself and peer review. And the amazing thing about that peer review process, I'm not a peer reviewer, I can't be, I'm not a museum professional, I'll never do an accreditation site visit, is that museums say to me, we learn so much from our peer reviewers. And and then the, um, the peer reviewers say to me, I learned so much f from doing that site visit. And it creates this incredible exchange of knowledge. And we're also creating a community of high performing museums. Now in the past, we weren't able to learn from that because our IT system was so bad, we couldn't get the data about these really high performing museums. Now we can do that. And I'm ho hopefully that will help us inform um, in, 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 in use that data about th this community of high performing museums to share with the field so people can see what is it about these museums that, that why did they go through accreditation? What are, they, what are they doing right? How are they doing it? And, and we used to have accreditation was just one point on the horizon. You were either standing still or you were on the ceiling. Now we created a continuum of excellence and the first step in that is a museum signs a pledge. I will do my best to meet the standards of the museum field. Nobody's, nobody will ever call on you, nobody will ever visit, there's no, you just say, we're gonna do the best we can. And then we created some programs that are midway along uh, that museums can go through in their journey towards becoming accredited, or maybe they choose not to be accredited, but they've still benefited from excellence programs. And we've worked with some of our fellow museum service organizations, the Association of State and Local History and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums to, to, 
to combine our programs to some extent with theirs so they become collaborative um, in the hopes, again, all of us hope the same thing. Can we improve the quality of museum practice? But it's all voluntary, and, and we don't belittle non-accredited museums. But this is an accredited museum, so. <laughs> It, and actually, the amazing thing is that it was one of the first tasks that awaited Frank and me when oh, we bummer. arrived. No, it was fabulous. Um, it really was great. We were part of the first group in the new uh, realigned and streamlined um, uh, process, which, which served us well. But actually, you know what I think the most important piece of it is for Bowdoin, is that it enabled Frank and me as, as newcomers to this community to sort of align internal communication around the museum and and a small place like Bowdoin, that might not seem um, either difficult um, to, to achieve um, or, or much of a, a process. But in fact, we learned that through the um, accreditation um, process, we were able, we were prompted to ask questions of our colleagues around campus. We were prompted to sort of make sure that our vision of what we were doing aligned with the um, vision of the administration. Um, we were also able to just be sure that our own practices were sort of in line with, with best practices in the field. And actually, in a, in a funny way, it's really nice when you're a newcomer to an organization to have an opportunity from somebody in the field to, to say, yes, this is what what you should be doing, um, and uh, it was a great it was a great experience. There, there, there's I have to belittle this or beat this to death. I mean, but there's one many many times uh, a, a board may say to a museum director, you know, we're short a little money for on this expansion project. Let's just sell a couple paintings, and you know, uh, when, when the museum director says we'll lose our accreditation. Um, it, it gets a lot of attention. One, you know, the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University was a, a, a very good example where they decided they were going to sell, close the museum and sell the artworks. Um, and there was just a huge, uh, huge outcry about that. And that, at the end of the day, the museum was still there and the president was gone. So standards worked. Anyway, other questions? In the back, or... As someone who works in an art museum, I um, was silently cheering when you were talking about the essential nature of museums in our culture, yet I'm, I'm constantly frustrated by the fact that the rest of the culture doesn't uh, appreciate museums in that way, um, despite the fact that I think museums today are increasingly finding ways to expand their mission, to increase their outreach, to yep. be as accessible as possible. Um, I'd be curious to hear if you see any trends in, in the culture at large that are either helping or, or hurting our case in that way. I mean, unfortunately, during an economic downturn like we've experienced recently, often the first things that get cut are art funding in schools, which, as you suggested, impact field trips and so forth. I'm wondering if you see other trends coming in the next few years that may, as I suggested, either help or hurt our, our cause of, um, uh, of getting everyone on board with the notion that museums are essential, not amenities. I th I, you know, one trend is just the fact that museums are committed to doing things they weren't doing before. You know, museums are, are now really in being, want to be in the community and part of the community and figuring out they can't solve every problem, but they can find a problem that, or a challenge in the community that they feel they can address. And that's, I think that's gonna help, really help us as people realize that museums are not places that just hang stuff on walls. The other thing is, um, when I came to AAM, w there was no field-wide advocacy, I mean, none. And I hired this force of nature woman, uh, Gail Silverglede, who built a fabulous advocacy, collaborative. Uh, she said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to build uh, a, a, an, an effective, entrepreneurial, collaborative government relations organization. And I had no clue what that meant. It just sounded, it just sounded so good. And, and she did it. And so we just had our eighth, seventh advocacy day. Um, we had 275 people participate from every state and we did 350 hill visits. And we, that didn't exist before. We didn't have a website where you could go and contact your state legislator um, and, and tell him or her, figure out which, one you're, which district you're in and tell him or her why they need to support your museum. I think we've gotten all of us, all the organizations, our, our advocacy day is not our advocacy day. All the museum service organizations participate. It is a fields advocacy day. And you know, I think it's um, the first time we did it, there was 
two members of Congress signing our dear colleague letter about IMLS funding. This year we had 136 members of Congress, including thir uh, <coughs> 32 senators signing our dear colleague letter. That's, that, it, that's going in the right direction. We're not there yet, but we were so far behind that it's going to take us a while. But that field-wide advocacy is going to make a big difference for us, I think. We got one here. Yeah. There's one here, and then could could we make it two? Because there's been somebody very patient in the, the back. Back. Yes. <laughs> Whoever gets the mic first. We have the mic. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I am delighted to have heard you signal, though not surprised the quality of the museum next door. Oh. It truly is splendid. And I'd like to focus a question that might be summarized in the tension between recreation and recreation, leaving aside the responsibility of a museum to accumulate, interpret, and display artifacts of culture. One, a museum, and you had referred to the gate at the Corcoran as being a problem in its financing. And then on the other side, you have the Museum of Modern Art, which has a gate that's extraordinary, and in some ways seems, from the outsider's perspective, to be responding to the financial benefit of that gate. Do you see that there is a tension between recreation, which has educational and personal enlightenment and community enlightenment dimensions that are prominent, and recreation, going there for fun, and to be seen, at, at least as can be demonstrated, I think, by the behavior of many of the people who are there, that is inimical to the recreational aspect. Do you see that as a tension? And if so, how does it get resolved? Wow. Um, I, I, I think that's a great comment. And I, I don't think it gets resolved, because I think that's, what, that's one of the things about museums. They are there for recreation, and some people use them recreationally, but they're also there for recreation. And, you know, after 9-11, museum attendance went around the country, went through the roof. And museum attendance always goes up in, in times of national tragedy or stress, um, because museums are unique. They are familiar places that you've known often since your childhood. And they're places where you can go and be in peace if you want. Um, you can go and s be inspired at, 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 at difficult times or whenever you feel like you need that. So that recreation piece is obviously very, very Im important. But some people use it for recreation. And, you know, and sometimes that recreational piece is what gets people to come back for the recreation piece because they've gotten to know the museum. I, I, I think it's an interesting dichotomy, but I think it's the nature of the beast, and I think it exists in, in museums that, 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 that it's always going to be there. Uh, now, there's very few MoMAs, and uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a unique case. Uh, you know, your average community museum is, is, uh, is very, very different. People find um, your average community museum is one that, where that recreation goes on with working with your colleagues and your neighbors and your friends to help create a better museum, to volunteer, to put on a show, to, to, to do whatever. Um, so, but, but I, I think there will always be some piece of that, that where there's the recreation piece. But we'll be known for our recreation. Oh, no, I think we have one final question. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay. Take one more. All right, okay. Hi, uh, thank you for coming, appreciate it. Um, one just quick question, can you explain why and when the rule to only use money from selling art can be used for buying more art? Um, whenever I hear how and why, I know I'm, I know I'm in trouble. Um, uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. That, that's a really good question, and it's one that we get asked a lot about. The rule, is, you know, the, the standard is, you, you cannot sell art. Um, now, the Association of Art Museum Directors has a slightly different standard, um, uh, our fellow museum service organization. You, proceeds from the sale of art can be used to buy art or to improve the conditions, the uh, uh, care of the art, direct care of the art. And we have a task force right now trying to figure out what direct care means. At AAM, our standards are that you can only use proceeds from the sale of art to buy more art. Now, 
that seems like an arbitrary standard, um, and we get a lot of questions about that. Um, but the, the, the rea and I'm not an accountant, and I um, have never been able to balance my checkbook, so it's really bad. But the Federal Accounting Standards Board, back in the early 2000s, um, wanted to capitalize collections. So that means they, they believed that collections were an asset, and they had to be treated as an asset. So that means if, it's an, if your collection is an asset, um, that means you ha theoretically you have to do an appraisal every year. Um, and, uh, and then theoretically that those assets could be attached in any legal proceeding. And then the, real, the other problem is when you go to raise money and you look at your balance sheet, you've got $400 million or a billion dollars or $20 billion in appreciated net assets. Having to do an appraisal of your whole collection every year or every few years would be a nightmare for some museums. So there was a trade-off before, before my time, BMT, and it was that, um, that um, the trade-off with FASB, the Federal Accounting Standards Board, was that museums would not be required to capitalize their collections as long as they didn't treat them as assets. So um, that's actually a good deal, but um, I'm worried, I'm, I'm worried that we could be refighting re that. The people that fought that battle have told me it was a long, difficult slog to get that done. Um, I, but today, unfortunately, sometimes museums, not just art museums, natural history museums, history museums will sell things and, 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 and use it to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to fix the roof or build a building. That's going to get us in trouble, and I, I, I hope we maintain that standard so that, so that collections can keep that exemption. Off. Okay. If we happen to live in a state where the current discourse is about actually taxing nonprofits on their assets, if, if we had to capitalize the value of a collection to a museum, could that potentially be part of that tax? They would tax that, yeah, absolutely they would tax that, yes. And, yeah, you know, that, and that, the tax issue, you know, I, I also am very concerned about President Obama's proposal to reduce the deductibility of charitable contributions. Um, I don't. The, the, I understand that the, what he proposes, the small amount he proposes to reduce it, that isn't the problem. The problem is our charitable deduction it has built the greatest civil society in the world. Uh, and once you start messing with that number, then every year it's a target, and it's. You know, we're going only going to reduce the deductibility three percent this year, and the next year we're all we're only going to reduce it three percent and four percent and three percent, and pretty soon that's gone, and that would that would be a huge problem, not just for museums, but for the entire nonprofit sector. All right. Was there one more? Yes. for-profit businesses like Museum Hack, um, who were really transforming how visitors experience museums. But it's an outside business. It's not coming from within the museum. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on that um, and its effect on the museum field. I don't know what Museum Hack is, I'm afraid. Is that a... It's a, it's a for-profit business in New York City providing tours of oh, yes. places like the Met. Um, but it's not put on by the Met. It's a for-profit right, right. outside uh, business. Yeah. I know the, the syndrome. I, um, I, uh, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, it's one way for people to see the museum. I don't know how, I know the museums aren't thrilled with it, and so I don't know how they control that. Um, I, I think you'd be crazy to pay money to some person you don't know a thing about to take you through the museum, but um, I think we'll have to see how that plays out. I, I, you know, it's, it's kind of a New York phenomenon. I don't think it's happening anywhere else. And anywhere? Not yet, but no. talking about growing to other cities. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. You know, it's hard to see it playing in Minneapolis, but maybe it will. Um, yeah? The Science Museum of Minnesota has issues with religious organizations coming through and giving their own tours. Oh, well, that, that, goes, that goes on everywhere. Yeah. That goes on everywhere. And some museums actually let, let, let them change the labels, with, you know, put sheets of paper up and just change the labels. That happens everywhere. That's already happening. Um, but the, the guides, the, the hacker, um, you know, I, we'll see how that plays out. I, uh, I, don't know if they, it, it, I, I don't know if the museums can 
legally stop those people from coming in? Because how do you prove that money changed hands? I just don't see how you can legally stop it. Uh, but, and if people, my idea of a museum is visit is not paying somebody who I don't think about to yak in my ear about the museum. Um, you know, I want to go and have a, my own experience. So we'll see how it plays out, but I, I can't predict that. Well, thank you all for your very stimulating and interesting questions, and we want to thank our special guest, Ford Bell, for all he has shared with us. And, and we 